The Lord be with you. Pastor Moak here, Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church. We have class number 13, class number 13, lesson number 13 from our catechetical series. We are going to talk today about the first article of the Apostles' Creed, about God the Father. We're going to talk about angels. We're going to talk about humanity. We're going to talk about the image of God. We're going to talk about creation. We're going to talk about the doctrine of preservation. A lot of stuff to talk about today. But before we get started, let's turn to page 32 in our catechisms. How the head of the family should teach his household to pray morning and evening. In the morning, when you get up, make the sign of the Holy Cross and say, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's confess the Apostles' Creed together. Uh, you know, instead of doing the Creed today, since we're doing just the first article, let's say our memory work. So we're going to say the first article of the Creed, and then we're going to say the what does this mean. Okay? Um, so that, if you need to follow along, I don't have the page here, do I? Yes, I do. Um, it's on page 15. So let's say the, the Apostles' Creed, the first article. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and he still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support my body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Okay, so we confess the creed. Now, instead of... Um, uh, singing the hymn that we did last week. So last week we sung a praise hymn to God. Um, now we are going to go back to our Lord's Prayer hymn, hymn 766, because in that hymn we are directing our prayers to God the Father. And we are learning about God the Father today. So turn to hymn 766, and we are going to sing <coughs> uh, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Ready? Let's sing. Our Father, who from heaven above bids all of us to live in love as members of one family and pray to you in unity. Teach us no thoughtless words to say, but from our inmost hearts to pray. Your name be hallowed, help us, Lord, in purity to keep your word. That's to the glory of your name. We walk before you free from blame. Let no false teaching us pervert. All poor deluded souls convert. Your kingdom come, guard your domain, and your eternal righteous reign. The Holy Ghost enrich our day with gifts attendant on our way. Break Satan's power, defeat his rage. Preserve your church from age to age. Your gracious will on earth be done, as it is done before your throne, that patiently we may obey. Throughout our lives all that you say, curb flesh and blood and every ill that sets itself against your will. Okay, now why did we sing those four verses? We specifically sung that last verse because that last verse was about God's will. So we prayed to God the Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, God the Father is the creator of the universe. We just said that in the Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. God is the creator of all things. God governs all things. 
and so also God has established his will. His will is revealed in nature. We see that the universe has order and structure to it. God's will has been revealed in his word, where he directs us how to live. Remember the three uses of the law, curb, mirror, and guide. For the Christian, it's a guide on how we are to live according to God's will. So we especially sung those verses today kind of to, to teach us and get us in the mindset of this first article of the creed. Now, uh, uh, let's turn to page 108. 108. I thought I had a mark. Yes, I do. Okay, let's say the memory work again. So, as I've said before, I said this last week, I'm going to say it again this week. We are getting to the most difficult parts of the memory work for this entire year. On the calendar year, the way we've been going through the fall, we've done the Ten Commandments, short little bits of memory work, sentence here, sentence there. Three article of the creeds are a lot bigger. Paragraphs worth of stuff to memorize. Go through it every day. Keep reciting over and over again. Read it, read it, read it. Read it, mark it, learn it, inwardly digest it. You could memorize all the scriptures or you can memorize succinctly what we have been taught in the creeds uh, which tell us about who God is and it's important to know who God is. So let's say the memory work together. The first article, page 108, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support my body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Um, let's uh, dive right into the text now. Question 96. Why is the first per person of the Trinity called the Father? A. God is the Father of my Lord Jesus Christ and also my Father through faith in Christ. These are most comforting words. So we can go directly to our Father with our prayers and petitions because of Jesus. This is pure gospel. Remember what gospel is? What God does for us for Jesus' sake. So even by having the privilege and honor to be able to call the Heavenly Father our Heavenly Father, my Heavenly Father, it's all because of Jesus and what he did for us. Let's look at that Bible verse, Matthew 3, 17. A voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And so also through our baptisms, God the Father can make the same declaration about us. Because we are baptized into his name, he could say, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, with whom I am well pleased. Because he is pleased with what Jesus has done. And by faith in Christ, Jesus' merits are given to us. <clears throat> okay, let's go to B. <clears throat> he is also the father of all people because he created them. Strictly speaking, there is only one human race because all human beings are equally the children of Adam and Eve and are equally redeemed by Christ. This is most comforting too, that God the Father is, is a father because he is a creator. Remember, that's the work ascribed to him. Let's review real quick uh, some of his attributes. Remember, this is important to be able to snap the finger, say these things. So if I say, uh, if I say a word, you give me the synonym or the explanation. So omnipotent. All-powerful, omnipresent, all-present, gracious, showing undeserved kindness, omniscient, all-knowing, holy, a personal being without, I'm sorry, uh, holy, um, without sin and hating sin, uh, spirit, personal being without a body. Got those mixed up in the order. I'm trying to look at, remember how it is on the page. Am I missing any? Uh, immutable unchangeable. Is there any more? Faithful, keeping his promises. Eternal, did I do that one already? Without beginning or end. Remember, it's like a line. Mirror's pointing both ways. All right, let's keep going. Um, turn the page to page 110 in your catechism. Question 97. Why is God the Father Almighty called maker of heaven and earth? Answer. Because in six days he created all things out of nothing, simply by his word. Simply by his word. The word has power. The word is efficacious. That means it sets out 
to do and what, what it is sent out to do, it does. The word accomplishes what it is sent out to do. Circle Bible verse 325, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in today's world, people like to say that six days is not enough time for, for God to create everything. That's kind of the way um, that, that humanity views the universe nowadays. That um, there is no way that all of this could exist in just six days. But interestingly, an ancient way of thinking, the, there, was, there was still a problem with creation. People still struggled with God, you know, a God creating things in six days. But it was the reverse. So for us, it's, well, that's not enough time. For them, it was, well, that's too much time. If God is God, the Almighty One, and he speaks things through the power of his word at the snap of a finger. Why did he take six days to create everything? He could have done it all at once. So it's interesting how we have this you know, different way of thinking. But it's the same sinful flesh that wants to doubt God's word and what God says in his word. But of course, why does God create everything in six days? Well, he does everything for his creation. God is a loving God. He's a merciful God. He shows undeserved kindness. Now, of course, um, undeserved kindness uh, didn't... It wasn't the same as it is now because of sin. But before sin, remember, everything God creates is good. Everything he looks at is, is good and it's wonderful and it's magnificent. And so everything he does is for his creation. It's, and so, remember, uh, why does God rest on the seventh day? As Jesus is going to teach in the New Testament, the Sabbath day was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So it's a day of rest. And so these six days of work, and it gives us a pattern to, to mimic and, and imitate. And on that seventh day, it's a day of rest. And that seventh day is a day of rest for us to come and receive Christ's gifts, God's gifts. Okay, so um, let's go to question 98. What is meant by heaven and earth? All things visible and Invisible. Look at Colossians 1.16. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And last time we went through the Nicene Creed together, but I omitted the uh, first article of the Nicene Creed. And it was on accident, but it works out well because now we'll cover it here today. So remember in the Apostles' Creed, uh, the, the Apostles' Creed is the baptismal creed, the creed we should pray every single day, the creed uh, that we typically open these classes with. Um, the Nicene Creed, we call it the Communion Creed, or this is the creed that usually is spoken when there is Holy Communion in the divine service on a Sunday or a weekday or a festival. And the Nicene Creed, as we talked about last week, is a little longer than the Apostles' Creed. It goes into a little more detail about God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, and also God the Father. So, whereas the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, notice how the Nicene Creed begins. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and Invisible. So God creates even the invisible things. Now someone might say, well, what are those in invisible things? This is the spirit world, angels, demons. All those things are real and have been created by God. And Colossians 1.16 is where we get that from. Now you don't have to memorize that, but again, I'll read it. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Clearly that language has been adopted into uh, the Nicene Creed. So let's talk about some of those invisible beings. Now we're going to discuss the angels. <clears throat> 99, question 99. What invisible beings created by God are especially important to us? Simple answer. The angels. Note, underline this first sentence here. Uh, angel means messenger. Angel means messenger. That will be on your test. And this is true. Uh, let's see. Underline, angel means messenger. This is true. Of all the years I've taught catechism class, when it comes to this question on the test, what does the word angel mean? Nobody has ever gotten it wrong. And what I find is everyone is fascinated with angels. We love learning about angels. Well, why is that? Why is that the case? Well, I'll give you the simple reason. It's because we can't see them. And they're kind of mysterious to us. And we're intrigued by them. Hollywood uh, runs rampant with with uh, angels and movies all the time. There's TV shows, Touched by an Angel, for example. We're intrigued by them. So uh, I know this is just one of the favorite things that um, young students like to learn about. And so uh, the important thing for you to remember, though, is that the word angel means messenger. And now let's talk, I'm going to keep reading. We'll talk a little bit more about it. So God frequently used angels to announce important events in the history of salvation. The birth of John the Baptist, the birth of Jesus, 
the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension and second coming of Jesus. So notice the angels are sent by God as messengers to be these proclaimers, these heralds of good news, heralds of the gospel of what God has done for his people. And one of the ones I want to specifically focus in on is the birth of Jesus. And last week we talked a little bit about the hymnal. And notice that during the season of Advent and Lent, we omit the song of the angels. The Gloria in Excelsis is what it's called. And the Gloria in Excelsis simply means glory in the highest. And if you remember in the part of the liturgy, in Divine Service Setting 3 specifically, the pastor sings, <clears throat> um, Glory be to God on high. And then the congregation responds in song, and on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, etc. We omit that hymn during the season of Advent and Lent. I shouldn't call it a hymn, a hymn of praise. We omit that during Advent and Lent because both of those seasons are pentatential in nature. And also, um, the more, uh, well, that's, that's, that's the theological reason. And practical reason, because it's this hymn of joy, we omit that during the penitential seasons and it makes it all the more special on the day that it returns on those festival days, such as Christmas and Easter. So in Christmas and Easter, we sing our glory in excelsis. Um, but yes, uh, but that is the song of the angels, the glory in excelsis, the song of the angels. So as the angels proclaimed God's word to his people at the important times where God interacts with his people through the person of Jesus, uh, so also uh, we acknowledge that the angels are the messengers of God, and that's what their name again means. Angelus is the Greek word. So question 100. What else does the Bible tell us about angels? A, they are spirit beings who were created holy. B, some angels rebelled against God. They are the devils or demons. Look at that Bible verse, 2 Peter 2.4. You don't have to memorize it. God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Now, everyone always asks, this is a question that comes up every single year, when did the angels sin? When did the angels fall away? The scriptures don't tell us. We know that it was after creation. Why? Because go back up one verse at, uh, above and to Bible verse uh, 329, Genesis 131. God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. So all things are created during creation. What's not created? God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We talked about that last week. God is the only thing uncreated. The three persons of the Trinity, uncreated. Everything else is created. And so we know that they were created good. And we know that they were apart from sin. Because if something's good, it can't have sin. Right? Okay. And all we and so we know uh, that in creation, the angels are created. We know that in creation, the angels are good. So the angels fall some point between the beginning of creation and when the serpent enters the garden and tempts Eve and Adam to sin. And we don't know how much time elapsed. The scriptures don't say. We just know that at some point between creation and between uh, the, Satan entering the garden to tempt Adam and Eve, that's when sin happened. And that's all we can confess. We just have to leave it at that. Okay. Uh, C. The good angels are many and powerful. They serve God and help us. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of, of verses there that... that that talk about this. So let's just look at Luke 2.13. Suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God. That's the birth of Jesus. That's part of the glory and excelsis. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Psalm 91. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Satan's going to use that verse in temptation of Jesus to try to get, uh, get him uh, to take that verse out of context. And that's what Satan often does, doesn't he? And that's, that's what makes him a liar. And we're going to talk about his attributes in just a few moments. But Satan knows God's word better than we do. The problem is, is he doesn't believe in it uh, for the forgiveness of sins. But he knows it. He understands it. And that teaches us that just knowing God's word doesn't, benef doesn't merit us salvation by any means. Uh, whatsoever. It benefits us insofar as it helps us learn who God is and encourages us and gives us more boldness to share it with others. But it doesn't merit us salvation. It doesn't give us salvation whatsoever. But it's important for us to still learn, nevertheless. But either way, Satan knows the scriptures and he uses them. Uh, think of him in the garden where he says, uh, did God really say, etc., etc., to Eve? Uh, so Satan knows the scriptures. He just tries to twist them around and make us believe falsely about them. 
Same thing with Jesus when Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness for those 40 days. And look at Hebrews 1.14, a most comforting verse, 3.3.5. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So angels are servants of God. Now, yes, we can't see them. That is true. Um, but it doesn't mean that they aren't there serving us and ministering to all of those who believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. That is most comforting to us. That's their purpose. That's what God has sent them to do. Okay, let's flip the page. D, now we're going to talk about evil angels. The evil angels are also many and powerful. They hate God and seek to destroy everything that is good, especially faith in Christ. And now we're going to talk about the attributes of the devil. So as God has attributes, he's omnipotent, which is what again? All-powerful. Omniscient, all-knowing. Omnipresent, all-present. Holy, without sin and hating sin. Eternal, without beginning or end. Immutable, unchangeable. Gracious, showing undeserved kindness. Now let's talk about the devil's attributes. Look at Bible verse 3 through 8. You don't have to memorize any of these verses, but I want you to underline a few things. So I'll read it. And these are the ones sown along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Underline, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word. And then next to that Bible verse, write the word thief. I will show you this in a minute, but we'll keep going for time's sake. <clears throat> so Satan is a thief. John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So underline, he was a murderer from the beginning. And also underline the last part, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And next to that Bible verse in the space provided, write, murderer and a liar. So Satan is a thief, he's a murderer, and he's a liar. Now, 1 Peter 5, 8-9, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Underline, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And next to that verse, write the word predator. <clears throat> so here you go. Write thief, murderer, liar, predator. And those are the things that you're supposed to underline. You can pause this page. And at the bottom I wrote, know your enemy. It's important for us to know our enemy so that when we, when we see him in his devious, deceitful tricks, we can thwart him. We can crush him as uh, Jesus did by crushing the head of the serpent. Um, oh, I wish you had, I know you have questions and I wish I could foresee the questions you might be having, but call me and we will talk about those things. Um, so again, Satan, thief, murder, liar, predator, all negative things. And see, this is something interesting about evil, by the way. Uh, evil can't create. God is the creator. God is good. God creates. God is the father. God creates. All evil can do is undo that which is good. Okay. So that's what evil does. It undoes what is good. And so when we see destruction, so for example, uh, you know, think of a, a terrorist attack and, and, and a building blows up. Um, evil isn't creating anything. It's destroying things. And that's what Satan wants to do to your faith. He can't create unbelief. What he does is he takes away belief. Okay, so and, and, and here's why this matters. It shows that Satan has no power. He has no authority. I'm sorry, he has power. He has no authority. So he can't do anything on his own. All he can do is take away what God has given you. All he can do is take away what is good. And so this this should, uh, this should is, is a reason why we should not fear him. This is why we put our fear, love, and trust in God alone. God has authority and he has power. Satan has no authority whatsoever. His power is only, it's only deceitful. He only convinces us that he has power because by trickery and by deceit, because he's a thief, and he's a murderer, he's a liar, he's a predator. So, for example, because he is a murderer, he has power insofar as he makes us afraid of him. So when a terrorist attack happens, for, for, for example, and we see a building blow up and people get killed, it makes us scared that that could happen again. So that's the only power he has. It's deceitful. It's destruction. Uh, and so, uh, again, live in repentance and cling to the gospel. Cling to the hope 
of the forgiveness of sins in Christ. Let's keep going. But know your enemy. Because he's a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That verse there in 1 Peter 5. So let's talk about humanity now. Uh, question 101. Who are human beings? Human beings are the most important visible creatures. God created Adam and Eve in his own image with authority over all the earth. So God gives dominion uh, to, the, to, to man. Um, he, he also uh, gives them, uh, um, let's just read Bible verse uh, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man as, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Notice the repetition there. Emphasis on God is the creator. God created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So man has been given dominion, lordship over creation. And where there is lordship, there, that means that there is a responsibility. And this is important for us, is that we have responsibility to take care of the earth and, and responsibility to oversee things. And one of the ways that uh, man uh, has dominion is by the fact that we name. If you remember, Adam names all of the creatures that have been created. And whenever you name something, you have authority over it. And this actually ties into parenting. So a child doesn't get to pick his or her own name. Uh, no, they have no authority to do that. A mom and dad gives them a name. And by doing so, when you can name something, you can claim something. So we name a child. And, 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 and now that child is, is ours. Now, the child is ours apart from us naming it. But now that it has been given a name, it becomes personal. And there's a relationship that has been established. And the one who has the authority is the one who names. So this is backwards and twisted and deluded and insane for a parent. And this is happening in, these, in today's society. This is why I'm pointing it out. It's insane for a child, uh, for a parent to say, well, I'm going to let my child decide what his or her name should be. Or let's take it a step further. It's insane for a parent to say, I'm going to let a child pick what gender that they have. It's absolute insanity because that is not how the created order works. God has given dominion to humanity and God has given authority to moms and dads and it is a dereliction of that authority when we try to give it to the children uh, and, and actually hurts them. It's, it's, it's not for their benefit. That's a lie of Satan. Again, remember what Satan does. He destroys things, right? He tries to take the created order that is good and he tries to take it away and flip it upside down on its head. Because if he can do that, then it makes it ungood. And what is ungood? It's bad. It's evil. Right? Okay. It's not for our good. So, again, God's order is for our good. And we should abide by it and stick to it. <clears throat> okay. Let's go to question 102. Why do we say God has made me? God created the first man and woman and God has created each one of us. And so even though biologically we know that when a man and a woman come together in, in holy matrimony, in the state of marriage, and they have sex with one another, which is a God-pleasing thing, uh, and they, uh, that act will, uh, Lord willingly, procure children. A, 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 the sperm and the egg come together and a child is created. But the man and the woman didn't create the child. They did the biological act of causing those two biological things to come together. But it is God who creates the life. God gives life. God breathes life into that unborn child. Okay, <clears throat> let's keep going. Question 103. How did God first create life? And this is one of the most important questions in this entire section. Okay, this is we, we, we are confessing something very, very important here. And I should have written down what I want to tell you. And I want to write it down so that way you can make sure you see it and spell it correctly. So, how did God first create life? Life. God created all. Underline those three words. God created all. And then the sentence goes on. All living things, both plant and animal, by his word alone. Underline those four words. By his word alone. <clears throat> so God created all by his word alone. You should have those seven words underlined. From nothing. He created humanity a uh, specially, he created humanity specially from dust. Then God gave us his own breath as life. And next to the question, I want you to write the word efficacious. I talked about this earlier, but now I want you to write it. Efficacious. E-F-F-I-C-A-C-I-O-U-S. 
efficacious. Efficacious. Again, what that word means is God's word is powerful. It actually accomplishes that which it sets out to do. So the greatest example of this um, in everyday life is when a minister um, has a wedding and he says to the husband and wife, I now pronounce you husband and wife. It is those words. It is a performative speech act that in the pronouncement of those words, the words actually perform that which they say. So again, I now pronounce you husband and wife. If the minister doesn't say those words, the couple is not married. This is actually true. Um, this is this, the state acknowledges this. This is not some theological truth. Uh, this is uh, this is human understanding. Words, um, when, where there is authority behind the words, the words actually mean what they say. Okay. Now, uh, and they actually accomplish what they say to do. Now, when it comes to creation, God the Father speaks His word. And by the way, at creation, the word is the second person of the Trinity. It is the pre-incarnate Christ before the second person of the Trinity takes on human flesh that we celebrate at Christmas. We call that the incarnation. But before the incarnation takes place, God the Father speaks the word, and the word is God the Son, remember, begotten from eternity. We're going to learn about that in the second article of the Creed. And by that power of the word, creation happens. Now here's a tie-in to the sacraments. Remember baptism. What is baptism? It is not just plain water. It is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. So in baptism, we have the water. Without the word, it is just water. But where there is God's word, it is more than that. It is a life-giving water full of grace. We're going to learn that when we get to the third and fourth parts of baptism. We're going to talk about that specifically. But notice it's the power of God's word. So in baptism, it is not merely the pouring of water over a child's head that makes the baptism a baptism. It is instead God's word because God's word is efficacious. It actually accomplishes what it sets out to do. So when the minister says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit pouring that water over the head. The water is important because that's the way God instituted it. And we have to do things the way God institutes. But when the pastor speaks the words, the word of God, now it becomes a baptism. And God works through his word. And so it is not the pastor baptizing the child or the adult. It is God who baptizes the child or the adult. And it is through the power of his word, the same way that creation happened at the very beginning. All right? Very cool stuff. So you need to know this. How, because this is going to be on your test, how did God create life? God created all by his word alone. I should say the question, how did God first create life? God created all by his word alone. And he, can, and he still, he continues to work through the power of his word even today. And we will talk about that again when we get to the Lord's Supper section also. <clears throat> all right, let's keep going. Question 104. What plan does God use for the reproduction of living things? God created living things to reprodu reproduce according to their kinds. Animals, plants, and people can reproduce only living things like themselves. Now, remember when we talked about science earlier, uh, uh, this, is, this is last week, when we talked about God's omniscience, his all-knowingness. A lot of times today, uh, science and evolu evolutionary science suggests that different kinds of, of creatures uh, changed over time into different kinds. So the most common example is uh, science will say that humanity has evolved from apes. Well, apes are a different kind. They are a different kind than humans are. There is zero evidence whatsoever in the history of, of the world as we know it of this change from one species to another. That's called uh, macroevolution. There is no evidence of macroevolution. Now, microevolution is change within a species. So change within a kind, okay? I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I believe this is later on in this in this unit today. But either way, why this all ties in, ties in together and matters is if you remember the famous story of Noah and the ark. When Noah brings two of every kind of creature onto the boat, he wasn't taking uh, two of every species. He was taking two of every kind. So he took two dogs, two canines, for example. Could have been wolves. It could have been poodles. We don't know. Uh, he took two of the kind, okay? So, uh, the kind here uh, is, the kind here, we acknowledge, has variation. So, uh, we would say that from those two 
canines, for example, that Noah brought on the ark, now we have all the variation and change of different dog species throughout the world. And so we celebrate the diversity of life that God has put into motion, into the genetic code of all living things. We celebrate that. But we have to make clear that what we won't say is that, um, that, there, is, that there has been evolutionary change from one kind to the next. So in other words, of canines don't convert to cats. Right. Okay. That, so that's what we're confessing here. That's the important thing that we have to make sure we, 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 we stay faithful on. But we will get to a little bit more of that, uh, I think, later on in, in this unit. How many pages do we have left? Just a couple more. I'm kind of, where's my notes? Um, okay. Let's keep going. A uh, couple more pages. So uh, question 105. What is the Christian's proper response to theories of evolution regarding the beginning of the world? If I just would have read ahead, I would have seen that that's where we, we get this very, the very next question. By faith, Christians believe what the word of God teaches about creation. Evolutionary theories are not scientifically verifiable. And what that means is, again, remember what science is. Remember, God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. Science is to know something. And what we know is what we can observe. So we observe things and we make conclusions about them. Evolutionary theory has to remain a theory because no one was there thousands of years ago when God created everything by the power of his word alone. So things were rapidly changing. I mean, imagine the entire universe created in six days by the power of God's word. I mean, certainly there was a lot of banging going on. Going on. I say that because of the big bang theory, right? So things were banging and popping and, you know, blursing and blur. I just totally made up a word. But you get the point here. A lot of stuff's happening early on. And the rules of order have been established by God in his creation. But since none of us were there to observe them, we can't scientifically verify any of the evolutionary theories that have been proposed. If you want to have more questions on that, give me a buzz. Okay, a uh, couple Bible verses that support this. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the, by the word of God. Here's that power of God's word that we, that we confess, that God creates everything by his word. It's in the Bible. This is what we confess. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Okay, so in other words, God creates everything out of essentially nothing. I shouldn't say essentially. That's our that's what our confession is. Ex nihilo. God creates everything from nothing because it's by the power of his word. So everything that exists, exists because God brought it into existence. All right. Uh, let's go to question 106. What was the image of God? The image of God was this. Adam and Eve truly knew God as he wishes to be known and were perfectly happy in him. B. They were righteous and holy doing God's will. So let's start with what the image of God is not. It doesn't mean that Adam and Eve looked like God. First of all, remember, God the Father is a spirit. And what was that? A personal being without a body. Adam and Eve have a body. God doesn't have a body until the incarnation in the person of Jesus. Before that, God remains spirit without a body. Okay? So the image of God, then, is original righteousness. And the way I remember this is the acronym Igor. I-G-O-R. Image of God, I-G-O-R. Original righteousness. Now that's a mouthful of words to say. Image of God, original righteousness. What is original righteousness? It's B under this question. They were righteous and holy, doing God's will. So Adam and Eve were without sin. Remember, they were created good. Okay? So when we talk about the image of God, <clears throat> it is original righteousness. Humanity had the righteousness of God. They were holy they were without sin. They were they had fellowship with God face to face. There was nothing that separated them, uh, the, the creation from from God. That's why God walks with Adam and Eve in in the will in, in the garden uh, before the fall. Okay, so again, uh, that's gonna be on your test. I'm gonna say what is image of God, and the answer is original righteousness. And you need to know what original righteousness is because it's important to know, and that means being without sin. They were holy. They they and, and, and not only that they they loved doing God's will. They not only knew God's will, they loved it. So how many of us today, we know God's will, but we don't always want to do it? Because ah, that's not what the flesh wants. Because the flesh is so corrupted by sin that a lot of times the flesh doesn't want to do what God's will is. But Adam and Eve, before the fall, had, had that, that, what does it say? They, they knew God as he wishes to be known and they were perfectly happy in him. That was A. That means that they were righteous and holy and they did God's will perfectly. Now, here's the good news. We are still created in God's image even today. But it is tainted by original sin. But on the last day, that original sin will be wiped away for good. 
and that restoration of original righteousness will be for all the living and the dead who held faith in Christ Jesus until their last breath. So original righteousness will be restored on the last day. And that's one of the gifts of, of, of the resurrection that we will look forward to. When we will be perfectly happy in Christ, we will perfectly know God as he wishes himself to be known, and we will be righteous and we will be holy once again. Okay, so that's image of God. Now, question 107. This is the question and answer to what kind of we were just talking about. So do people still have the image of God? No. This image was lost when our first parents disobeyed God and fell into sin. Their will and intellect lost the ability to know and please God. In Christians, God has begun to rebuild his image, but only in heaven will, be it, will it be fully restored. So again, we are not created in the image of God in the, same, in the sense that Adam and Eve were. That has, that has been lost. But as it says here, it, will, it has begun to be restored where? In baptism. Because remember Galatians 3.27, all who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. And so that kind of begins that restoration of that original righteousness. Um, but of course, it will not be full until the last day. Because as long as we still have breath in our flesh, we will still have sin and the, and the taint of sin, the consequences of sin. Now, the, now original sin has been forgiven. Uh, the guilt of original sin has been forgiven in our baptism. But that doesn't mean that original sin goes away. That's still there and it's still plaguing us. Uh, every single day. That's why we sin. If original sin was gone, we wouldn't sin anymore. Because if original sin was gone, that means all that would be left would be original righteousness. And then we would be good all the time, but we're not. Okay. Um, let's go to question 108. We are almost done. God still takes care of me and all creatures. How does the universe still depend on God? Doctrine of preservation. God sustains all things by his wisdom and power. Circle Bible, verse 363, Colossians 1.17. Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The old King James word here was consist. All things consist. And consist means to kind of stand together. Okay, it's, it's glued. So God is like the glue that keeps the universe together. By together, I mean instead of falling apart in just complete chaos. So there is order. We see order in the universe. There is structure. Uh, there, there is, there is a set pattern. We know we, we can we can predict when the moon is gonna is gonna rise. We know when the sun's gonna set. Uh, we know when the tides are gonna occur. We we can map these things out. We know where the stars are gonna appear to move in the sky. Uh, we know these things. There's an order to them. That is God consisting all whole, all things hold together in Him. So this is our doctrine of preservation. Okay, so not only does God create things, he also preserves them. Now, uh, you could also say he conserves them. Um, and I say this because the distinction between preservation and conservation, preservation is the non-use of resources. Conservation is the wise use of resources. And God, uh, wisely, because he is infinitely wise, um, uses his creation for his glory and for the benefit of, of creation. Okay, so, um, yeah, so doc, but. Either way, we call it the doctrine of preservation, that God isn't just a, a watchmaker where he, set, he winds up the clock and just lets things go. Uh, that was the error of the deists. Our uh, founding forefathers of the United States of America, for example, were deists. They, 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 look, they viewed God as a watchmaker. God creates everything and then just kind of lets it run its course. Uh, fate, for example. We don't confess that. We believe that God still, we believe, teach, and confess that God still actively has a role in his creation and he preserves it. Um, he continues to, that it continues to bear fruit in, that, in, in life. Okay, let's keep going. So yeah, Circle Bible, verse 363, right there. Uh, question 109. So why are there evil and suffering in this world? This is a question everyone, uh, everyone struggles with at some point in their life. Evil and suffering are in the world because of sin. But in the suffering, death, and resurrection of, resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has demonstrated his power over sin and death. God in his almighty power and love causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. And it is faith alone that has to trust that to be true. So no matter what befalls you, no matter what pain, suffering, horrible things can happen in this life, you know people who have suffered, perhaps you've suffered yourself. Bad things happen. They do. It's a consequence of sin. Now that doesn't bring us any comfort. We have to confess it to be true, but just knowing that it is a consequence of sin in itself brings no comfort whatsoever. But the comfort comes in knowing that on the last day, everything will be restored. There will be no more tears. There will be no more sadness. Everything will be good 
just as it was in Eden before the fall of man into sin. And that's our hope. That's what we have to cling to. No matter how much suffering we go through here on earth, we know that the promises that God makes are fulfilled in Christ, and we will have that fullness on the last day. <clears throat> Question one time. What does God do to take care of me? A, he gives me food and clothing, home and family, work and play, and all that I need from day to day. I want you to circle both those Bible verses right there, 367 and 368. They are both incredibly comforting. I'm going to start with the second one, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So God cares about you. Even if you feel like he doesn't, he still does. Sometimes through suffering, he is bringing us closer to him. That's in 1 Peter also, where it talks about suffering being grace. That's God's undeserved kindness. So even through our suffering, sometimes it's bringing us to our knees in humility and repentance. And God wants us ultimately to trust him. But that first verse I also want you to memorize, because this is how um, Luther in the small catechism here encouraged us to pray before meals. So before meals, uh, we should always pray. Before and after meals, we should give our thanks to God for all that he gives us. Because remember, everything that's set before us um, is his gracious provision. We pray that in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. But a great way to start your meal in prayer is by starting with Scripture. That's the best way we can praise God anyway, is to give him his word right back to him uh, and imitate his own words that he has given to us right back. And the words are from Psalm 145. So we pray, The eyes of all look to you, O Lord, and you give them their food what does it say here? In due season. That's the way I like it. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Now I point that out because if you were to turn to the front of your catechisms, this is a frustration of mine, the, the front of this ESV, I'm sorry, yeah, the front of this ESV catechism, uh, the catechism at the front quotes the scriptural passages with the NIV. But here in the catechism uh, with the explanation and answers, it's the ESV. So NIV at the front, ESV here in the middle. And if you were to look up the daily prayer section, and it's on page 34, you would notice here it says, For asking a blessing, the children and members of the household shall go to the table reverently, fold their hands, and say, The eyes of all look to you, O Lord, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. But the ESV says, The eyes of all look to you, this is what we just read, and you give them their, their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. And what this is most comforting about is the due season here is that word kairos. Remember, we talked about that in a, in a previous uh, session. It might even have been the last one. No, I can't remember. But due season, God's proper time. You give them their food at the right time, God. God, you know. God, you provide. And Jesus will teach this uh, numerous times in the New Testament. Look at the flowers of the field, how beautiful they are. They neither toil nor spin, yet none of them are ordained. Yet all of yet Solomon and all his whatever is not ordained as much as the flowers of these fields. In other words, God's going to provide for his creation. God's going to take care of you. And we have to trust that, in fact, that's going to be true. Now, that doesn't mean that God's going to provide us with 20 chicken wings every day. Nope. It doesn't talk about spoiling here. It says God's going to give us what we need to support our body and life. And we have to trust that, in fact, that's going to be true. And if even if we feel like we are we are in, in great want, we are marooned on, on a desert island all by our, ourselves and we, we were to starve to death, does that mean that God failed to live up to his promise? No, not at all. Because he promises to provide what we need to support our body and life. And ultimately, that's fulfilled once again in the resurrection. And so even if our earthly life appears to us to end short, oh, God is still providing. All the more. Because to live is Christ, but to die is is gain. All right. Let's keep going. So God does take care of us. Again, uh, it's a great way to start your meals and prayers to kind of tie back into that scripture verse. The eyes of all to you, O Lord, and you give them their food into season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. And then, the, by the way, that, that table prayer concludes, bless us in these thy gifts, which we receive from your bountiful goodness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And that gets us in the right mindset that everything that we have that supports our body and life are gifts from God. And that means we owe him our thanksgiving. All right, uh, let's go to B <clears throat> on page 117. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. Question 111. Why does God do this for us? All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. That means that we aren't deserving more or less than anybody else. So if it looks like someone else is getting more stuff, 
and we have less or vice versa, we are getting more or someone else is getting less, it doesn't mean that God is any less gracious. He is equally gracious to all people. But remember, everything that God does in his infinite wisdom, and I, you know, we, we, we can try to analyze this until you know, we're blue in the face. We can only rely on what God has revealed to us in his word because remember God has made himself known in three ways, nature, Bible, and conscience. And as the scriptures reveal God's will, we just know we have to confess that God equally loves everyone because God shows no partiality. And so it very well could be, according to his wisdom, that you have less and I have more because God is trying to teach you uh, to trust him more. And maybe he's trying to teach me to thank him more and, and vice versa. I mean, we just don't know. We don't know. We can't make those assertions. But ultimately, we know that everything God does works out for good for those who love him. So it will be for our good. And, it's to, and, and by for our good, it means for us to trust him, to repent of our sins and to trust in his provision. That's ultimately always what God wants for and from us, is to trust him. Okay, question 112. What do we owe our Heavenly Father for all his goodness? Well, it is our duty to thank and praise, serve, and obey him. And then we conclude with, this is most certainly true. But the thank and praise, serve, and obey him reminds us of that second commandment, doesn't it? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, so we do not curse, swear you satanic arts, liar, deceive by his name, but... Call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. So we give thanks to our God for all the things that he provides us with. Now B, it says, be stewards of his creation. Be good stewards of his creation. And this is a reminder to us, as the note says, that we are good stewards when we avoid polluting air, land, and water. Carefully dispose of waste. Use rather than waste natural resources. There's that conservation, conservation, that conserving of what God has created. So the doctrine of preservation, God will preserve us. And also we are to conserve creation. We are to wisely use what he has given us. So that's why it says conserve rather than waste energy. Recycle or reuse materials whenever possible and value and take care of all God's creation. What a tremendous responsibility we have been given. And this is why it's a false notion, a false claim to think that God has given us freedom to do whatever we want. It's not true. God has given, a, given us freedom in Christ to serve our neighbor and to serve creation. We have tremendous responsibility. Having freedom is a, is, uh, is a wonder... Well, I, I've already said this, so I'll just repeat it again. Uh, freedom is responsibility. It's not free to do whatever we want. It's to be responsible, to do the things that God has given us to do, and take joy in that, knowing that on the last day we will have the fullness of that joy as we continue to serve uh, him uh, for all eternity and, 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 and receive his, his uh, magnificent presence. All right, so uh, I don't know what magnificent presence means. I don't know. Um, but that's the end of our lesson today. The last question is, why do we close the explanation of the first article with the words, this is most certainly true? Because everything I confess in this article is plainly taught in God's word, Holy Scripture. Therefore, I firmly believe it. So memorize this article and hold it dear to your heart. Uh, and just know that it summarizes all of the scriptures uh, in a succinct way. And it helps us know who God the Father is. Next week, we're going to learn the first half of the second article of the creed and i want you to learn up to the word death on page 119 it goes up to right here up to the word death so it's that whole first paragraph of the meaning you should know the creed by now the actual article so you need to know that part too but also that first half of the meaning because we're next week going to learn about jesus we're going to learn about our savior and what he has done for us that's good news so we will look forward to that a lot of stuff to memorize again exhortation here do your work. Memorize it now and keep learning, keep learning, keep learning. And as that word of God uh, dwells within you, it's going to manifest itself and, and it's going to bear fruit. Um, in, let, let God's word have its way with you and let it inwardly digest. And, and it'll become a part of your being, part of the way you think, and part of the way you live. Uh, with that, God be with you and we'll see you next week.